Well, I'm going to talk today about some work that I did with the uh, with the state of South Australia on um, carbon offset supply, costs, co-benefits from land use change, and uh, that will wait for the rest of the crew to come in. There we go. Hello. You go around. Hi. So uh, this, this is work that uh, this, this is work about um, the the emissions reduction fund. I think you may all be aware of the emissions reduction fund. So that's Australia's main and only uh, climate policy, possibly. And uh, a lot of what happens there is it's, it's kind of an auction system, and people put in bids and they can undertake prescribed activities. They can put in a bid to do it, and if they offer carbon at the least cost, then their bid can be selected and they can be funded and they get carbon credits for it. And uh, land use change and land use change activities were a big part of it. As a, as a matter of fact, most of the bids that were sponsored in the ERF. So this work was for the state of South Australia, uh, for a group called the Goiter Institute. What it is, is that funding was put in by the state government, all of the major universities, CSIRO, all the major research institutions in the state to address uh, water and climate issues. Um, and they wanted some, so what they found was that uh, th this ERF took place, there was a lot of uh, action in land use change, but very, very little in South Australia. And they wanted to know, you know, what are the, what's the economics of supply? Um, are there any opportunities in South Australia that could be competitive in this ERF? Um, and then uh, the second part was about co-benefit. So because nothing really happened uh, in South Australia and previous analysis suggested you need prices in the order of you know four times what they received in the ERF to do much land use change in the state. Um, the co-benefits hypothesis would it be possible that there'd be tangible co-benefits that would take projects over the line if they provide other benefits to farmers or benefits that could become tangible uh, because they're of value to someone who's willing to pay. So the study area is what we call the intensive agricultural zone of South Australia. That's really um, the area south of the very extensive pastoral districts that's shown there in the, uh, in the figure. And so what happens in the ERF is there's different what they call methods that are applicable. These are different, um, different land use changes you can do in prescribed ways and they're available at different places. So the, um, the top two, um, Mali revegetation and environmental plantings. This is really about growing new trees where they didn't previously exist that you have to seed and, and establish. Um, the, uh, the red one, the orange one, uh, carbon soil improvements, these, these are about things you can do in land use change management practice. You can go to no-till or you can take something that was in pasture, was in uh, cropping and turn it into pasture or some other things like that. Um, this one, uh, cease mechanical destruction. This is what they call um, human-induced revegetation. That's where you stop doing what you're doing, like you remove the grazing and you let trees come back themselves, but you don't have to do anything to establish it. So that was uh, the predominant methodology that got uh, a lot of credits and primarily in um, what they call the Mulga land areas of uh, western New South Wales and then Queensland. Uh, where basically if you take the stock away, the mulga grows back itself so that it's low opportunity cost. When do you get those maps? The maps you generated yourself? We, we made these, yeah. So what we did is we took the eligibility criteria and we mapped where that would be eligible in South Australia according to the criteria. Then we looked at some additional um, methods that aren't currently within the parameters of ERF but could be prospectively and may be interesting opportunities because they could be um, low opportunity cost or high ecological value. And um, so that involved some cases where you would regenerate um, forest but not as much as is in the UN definition of forest. So in other words, you have to have 20 percent of the landscape in trees more than two meters tall. In some of these cases like this um, Shiok rangeland regeneration, Shiok rangeland, this, these are um, open woodlands in places like uh, across Australia um, in and they, um, down along here, in sort of the Adelaide Hills and the Mount Lofties Ranges, and um, they've been mostly almost completely cleared because they're quite open and easy to clear. But if you went from 2% to 15%, for example, you could sequester a lot of carbon potentially, and it would also be, have high biodiversity benefits. Um, 
and so th these are these are all along those kinds of lines. Um, and so what we did in terms of the methods, and I'm not going to give you a lot of equations here, is essentially we estimated the uh, tons of CO2 supply by year over 100 years with full cam. Full cam is the default model that's used in the ERF. So um, to make it administrative low, low cost, what they do is they say, you can get onto this database. You could put in um, some spatial coordinates, Latin long, and say, OK, uh, I want to in, enter into an ERF contract here. And they'd say, OK, here's the schedule of tons per uh, hectare that you could expect to get credited if you do it in the right way, in the way that we describe here. Um, and uh, as I said, mostly with full cam, in some cases we looked at uh, the default values can be quite divergent from what might be directly measured, because it's another thing you can do, a direct measurement. More expensive because you have to monitor and measure, but maybe more accurate. And there'll be some cases where that may be advantageous. And the state told us about those possibilities, so we looked at them. Um, and then what we did is essentially say, um, OK, let's, let's look at the cost of doing that. And the cost here is full cost of land use change, including establishment cost and opportunity cost. Or in some cases where we thought opportunity costs may be less relevant because it's essentially amenity, property, lifestyle, lifestyle properties, we looked at the sensitivity to leaving that off. Uh, so some of the results from that, this is uh, environmental plantings. Uh, and basically, um, you know, what we showed was, yes, if you had very, very high carbon prices, you can get a lot of carbon sequestration. Um, but at the current price, basically, we didn't see anything that was economical uh, when we considered full cost because of the cost of establishing new uh, six or seven thousand dollars per hectare just to establish a environmental planting. Um, and that the first viable options occurred at around thirty eight dollars um, with a small amount and um, at fifty dollars, uh, a fairly significant amount. That's 130 megatons of CO2, the whole um, ERF um, got about 192 megatons. So that would be a significant amount. Yeah. Um, and Mali plantings, uh, so this option was more expensive, primarily because it's only eligible in uh, low rainfall areas. This is about establishing monocultures, and they don't allow for it to happen in high rainfall areas because of the water trade-off. Uh, the thinking is that environmental plantings are allowed because they have offsetting ecological benefit, but if you're going to take water and also decrease biodiversity, then they weren't going to allow that there. And so what that means is basically the, the cost curves are higher for that. Um, Mali rolling, so this, this is uh, the case where what you do is um, occasionally on eight-year intervals, they'll go in and they'll crush the existing um, Mali and let sheep run over it. And there's not really much in it in terms of return. But essentially, they keep on doing it to maintain the option value. Because if they go for more than eight years and don't roll it, then it becomes protected under Native Veg Act. Right? And so the point was, this may be a small niche uh, opportunity. And uh, indeed, that turned out to be that way. So we saw that you know, um, uh, that there could have been something in the order of uh, 20, for something like $21 a ton, we would have seen some, some opportunity for a small amount of carbon sequestration. Um, rangelands regeneration. So um, this is this is also a uh, human-induced method. So that means that you just take the stock away from the rangelands, and we're talking about you know the far uh, the far um, western edge of South Australia and some quite northern parts right across the top there. Um, and you can see that um, we we can start to see a little bit of supply at at relatively low prices from that option as well. Uh, oh, those are, that's the opportunity cost of the, uh, so no, that, sorry, that's the whole map of everything. So you can see is that um, some, of the, some, of the, the, some of the lightest yellow areas, and, and here's this kernel plot of it. So you can see that, you know, say at, um, at very low carbon prices, uh, you know, that would be in ERF range, you even see a small amount of opportunity about, I think that may be a mistake there, 9.5% of supply at, I think it's less than that. I think it's, uh, but, but in any case, there is some small opportunity, you know, at, at very low costs. It's just very, very niche. Um, the grassy woodlands regeneration in the Mount Loftiest ranges. Uh, again, you know, the first, the first supply at about thirty-eight dollars. So similar to a lot of other um, methods, 
Um, however, if we consider that you know this is this is sort of um, some of this is sort of metropolitan Adelaide um, satellite uh, lifestyle properties, and so if we left uh, the consideration of opportunity costs, we saw uh, some small opportunity at, at, at reasonably low prices as well. Uh, Drooping Shiok on Kangaroo Island, uh, another niche opportunity. Again, um, small opportunity at uh, at low price. We did some sensitivity analysis. So um, the point is that um, higher discount rates. We we used a normal discount rate of five percent, and then higher discount rates often represent uh, observed landholder reticence to change land use. Uh, you can see that in the literature. For example, if you look at um, what the implied discount rate that people need to change to uh, forestry land uses from um, uh, farming, often um, hurdles of you know uh, hurdle rates of more like 15% than uh, than the discount rate. So that that represents people's time preference for money. You know, forestry only yields uh, benefit later, and um, they're risk averse to changing land use to something they don't know about. So. Um, what that does is significantly, of course, decrease the supply at any given price. So there's um, supply from environmental plantings at uh, the default uh, interest rate we used and at a 15% uh, discount rate. So that sort of you know, reduces supply by two thirds. Climate change, um, not really a great climate change analysis. We, we just essentially shifted the carbon sequestration um, curves back based on a sort of a uh, scaling factor from some of the literature we could find that you know under various climate change scenarios this much less rainfall uh, reduces supply curves back there's probably more nuance to that um, because there's failure to establish and risks to climate etc and something that um, I'll be pursuing in some further work that I'm now working on with other um, with New South Wales Did you, uh, here's an interesting thing um, there's some restrictive conditions and um, conservative conditions in the air. They're built there for a reason. So what you've got is a policy compromise. Uh, you're trying to encourage people to sequester carbon um, and do it in a low transactions cost way. But there's also some risks. So we could have fires. Um, climate change could reduce the yields. There's potential for um, non-additionality and um, what they call anyway projects in particular those who are problematic for the um, uh, human induced revegetation so if you say oh yeah I'm going to take the livestock off uh, I, I intended to leave it on there forever you may or may not have right or um, I've got a permit to clear and I'll agree not to clear you, you may have not wanted to clear anyway so they call anyway projects so for these reasons they built some conservative factors into the ERF and so this is one of them. It's called the crediting period. Now, what the crediting period says is that, OK, you've got to put this land use change in place and keep it in place for 100 years. But you only get the credit value for the carbon that's produced in the first 25 years. right? And so the previous research is out there, like a lot of the stuff that I did previously at CSIRO with people like Brett Bryan and Neville Crossman. We've got a few papers out there on this kind of stuff. Um, we didn't really consider that realistic nuance of the actual policy. And so the top line here is credit supply um, with that crediting period properly accounted for and without it the way that we did it before. And what we can see is that obviously that moves supply back. Um, and especially in the price ranges that are realistic, sort of you know this, this area right here. And so I've, I've kind of put the, that price range and the differences in higher relief here. So this is. Uh, this is the case of environmental plantings. What we can see is that if we look at, say, uh, a credit price of $50, right, the um, reduction in supply relative to um, it is about 40% or uh, about 60%, right, or 50, 50, 55% or something like that. So it has a significant impact on, on supply. So the conclusions from that part was essentially that conversion to agricultural carbon planting is unlikely for most of SA landholders below $50. And that's pretty consistent with past research, so nothing really radical there. Uh, we did discover a number of niche opportunities where supply may be possible at prices closer to uh, $20 per ton. And, uh, and those are listed there. Those are, you know, um, 
just for perspective, I mean, they're, they're um, small percentages of change, but the amount of carbon that's potentially there compared to, say, what was sold into the ERF is still significant. It could be 10% of what was sold into the ERF uh, in the last round. So it may be that providing landholders uh, in these contexts information about these opportunities and facilitating low transactions cost ERF application process could support more of this for, for the SA government. Because what essentially happens in the ERF is that the application process is, is challenging. It's, it, it's quite technical. And um, also, it's got to be aggregated up into large blocks. You need 20,000 tons to actually put a bid in. And so what happened was that essentially most of the application process was run by what brokers that are called aggregators. And so what aggregators do is they provide a service, right? Um, and so where most of the bids went in is where aggregators had a good model. They knew there was an opportunity. They figured out the nuance of it. And so my conclusion here is that essentially um, additional information provision that could either give them a case for a business model or possibly because there's some debate about how much of a margin aggregators took and how fairly they shared risks with, uh, with farmers. There may be a case for some kind of public intervention, uh, public brokerage. Um, no one's really taken us up on that yet, but I, I think it's a good idea. So let me move on to the co-benefits part of the study. So really, the question there became, well, if there's not much carbon supply, um, would there be co-benefits? Would there be other things that farmers may benefit from? Uh, so they, they see it as a production advantage? Or would there be things that someone else would benefit from that they might be willing to mm, add in? So this is the idea of stacked and bundled benefits, where you would you know, stack one thing on top of another. Uh, and I guess the difference between stacking and bundling is whether you sell into two markets or into one market that sort of, you know, gives the aggregate uh, benefit of those two things. Um, and so what we did here, so this is kind of a stakeholder process. We were working with the government and they, they said, let us help you identify where we think some of the best opportunities are that we're most interested in. Um, these benefits can be quite public and, and very dispersed. So uh, I'm thinking of, say, erosion control or um, even greenhouse gas mitigation. These are things that you know, take place primarily far away from where the land action is taken and don't necessarily accrue much to the landholder, or things that may be more tangible to landholders. And, and the reference group was really more interested in those, more tangible things that could change the bottom line for a landholder. And so we came up with three. One is um, two are really farm benefit oriented, so that's the shelter belts. Uh, for reduced lamb mortality in the southeast and the Mount Lofty. These are very cold, windy parts of SA that are right down in the Southern Ocean. And so um, lamb mortality is a big issue. These, these baby lambs are born and they die because they're not sheltered, right? And so if you have shelters, then it's gonna, gonna help them. And that can be a tangible benefit to a farmer in addition to the carbon. Does the additional benefit take them over the line? Another one was uh, pollination. And in this case, we focus on one of the crops that, for which is most important in South Australia, and that's lucerne seed production. It's a high value proposition, um, and it benefits a lot from pollination. And the final one isn't so much a tangible benefit to farmers themselves, but this is something that's about water quality. So there's a lot of payments for ecosystem services that focus on water quality benefits, probably because what happens is that, you know, if you focus on riparian areas that lead into water catchments, then, you know, there's someone who's acting on behalf of the million um, residents of Adelaide who um, need to be provided good quality water. So the point here was essentially that if trees can block nutrients and that can reduce treatment costs, is the treatment cost savings an additional co-benefit that might take some of these projects over the line. So those are the three, three case studies that we worked through. So the riparian plantings for carbon and water quality. Um, so what you can see here is this is uh, suburban Adelaide, just at the, at the edge of suburban Adelaide in the hills. And the bottom of this catchment is the Happy Valley Reservoir. And there's a lot of mixed land use up here, including pastures and, uh, and various land uses like that. Um, and this is quite a shallow reservoir. A lot of phosphorus runs off, causes potential for algal blooms in the reservoir. They treat it with a kind of um, expensive and mm, chemical that has problems for occupational health and safety and environment called copper sulfate. And the question is, uh, so if we plant 
a lot of buffer strips along the stream segments that come down into here. Is the carbon and the avoided treatment cost uh, going to stack up as being able to pay for what it costs to establish them? Uh, here we used uh, two methods of um, carbon estimation. So full cam is here on the right. And a more accurate assessment based on uh, some work that had been done by some researchers in uh, South Australia, a guy called Hobbs. And so um, these are default values, and they're kind of on large aggregates. We've, we've kind of um, you know, blurred the lines here. But the default values don't change much across space, and they don't represent the spatial heterogeneity of how carbon is actually sequestered in the watershed. And they're much lower on the maximum. So there's the maximum there, 600 and something. And Trevor Hobbs's estimate, 1,700. And what's really going on here in particular, and there's more research on this in the carbon space, is that um, riparian areas in particular have very high potential carbon yields. That's because the, the, the rainfall that falls here is not representative of the moisture the trees receive. And you can understand that, right? So it rains uh, 500 millimeters on top of the hill over the year. But it all runs down, so there's double that effective rainfall at the bottom of these valleys. So that the communities of trees that you see there, and that's what this was based on. What do existing communities of trees look like that are in these different kinds of habitats and rainfall zones can be much higher. So this idea that riparian plantings may sequester a lot more carbon is essentially embedded in that. And by some direct measurement methods, you could get at that, and so you could get a higher carbon value. And so just to show you what that looks like when we did the carbon supply. So, um, and, and also because of the nature of this, you know, very close to suburban Adelaide, mostly lifestyle properties, not a lot of really commercial production agriculture. We considered the case um, with and without opportunity cost. And this is using those um, ERF full cam models. And so the point is that the price at which we saw um, a ton become, uh, it become viable. It was about $60 a ton um, with full cost and with that ERF method, all the way down to without, without opportunity cost and um, with the um, more accurate carbon accounting method, down to a price that would be competitive in the ERF. And in addition, we wanted to estimate what the, uh, what the water quality benefit would be. So what we said was, We'll look at these land uses. We'll pick the ones that could be where, in places where they could be revegetated. Look at producing buffer strips along the relevant stream segments. And then we um, use data from SA Water to estimate two relationships. One is um, percentage of the uh, stream. Uh, so this is, this is uh, width of buffer strip. Uh, so going from 10 meters to 40 meters. Um, and the percentage of the phosphorus loading going into the stream that's blocked. Uh, so, and, and so I've got error bars on. I haven't worked this. I haven't worked the um, uncertainty analysis through already, but some of it's here. Um, and so what this shows is, for example, you can expect a 10-meter buffer strip to block about 60% of the nutrients, and a 40-meter uh, buffer strip to block about 74%. The additional information we had was from the reservoir itself. Um, we could observe in uh, different periods over 20 years, these were qu this was quarterly data, what the phosphorus concentration was and how many times they treat it for algal blooms. Okay? And what this shows is the reduction in phosphorus load and the reduction in um, treatments for algal bloom. Okay? So again, what you can see is um, with higher reductions in phosphorus going into the reservoir, we can expect um, less need to treat for algal blooms. And so the economics, um, what you can see here is the costs. So they're the same uh, regardless of the, of the uh, carbon estimation method right here, the uh, full cam, the other one, but lower um, if you don't have to consider opportunity costs because it's just the establishment cost of the, of the trees. Okay, the credit values um, are the same if you use the same estimation method, but obviously if you get a lot more carbon from the other method, then you get a higher value of credits. Um, the water quality benefit is the same if you have the same trees in the same place, and so the stacked uh, net benefit is, is positive for all of these scenarios for the 10 meter buffer strip. For the 20 meter buffer strip, you get a similar thing, but you get some, in, in the worst case where you've got um, 
the high, the, you've got the uh, higher opportunity cost, the less carbon, et cetera, you get a negative net benefit for a 20 meter buffer strip. So what happens is you, you have to establish a lot more trees. Um, you get a little more carbon, you get twice the carbon, but you get um, a, a much, uh, only a small increment in reduced treatment costs. So that means that that one doesn't quite bear out the same way. So the conclusions were that you know the de direct me measurement method may be a viable alternative, um, yeah, and that uh, it could generate um, carbon credits would be near the cost of planting in some of these situations, um, and that if we sum the benefits of the treatment cost savings and the carbon benefit, we'd likely to have a winner here. Uh, the second uh, co-benefit study was pollination uh, and carbon in agricultural landscapes. So the point is that you know the more you create habitat for bees, including plantings like this, the more pollination you're likely to get, and um, that can increase uh, crop yields. Um, so the potential for a significant farm farm benefit, particularly uh, with feral honeybees, additional carbon value, and, and these can often create biodiversity benefits. But what's the economics? Uh, how do they vary with reserve design and the surrounding habitat and the production economics variability? So, mm, similar things. A little bit of background. Uh, so this is the case of uh, lucerne production um, and this is for seed. Uh, it can be very profitable um, and it's reliant on pollination. So. Uh, and, and also, you know, in addition to the scenario we really didn't get to is what can be the value of these things in uh, pollination collapse if we, cre if we pre create pollination reserves. So we used this case study approach. This wasn't across the landscape. We just used a representative farm in this case. Um, so we developed a stylized but realistic hypothetical farm um, and a range of revegetation scenarios including more vegetation directly around the farm and in the context where there's more habitat for bees close by or less habitat close by. We use the invest model. Um, it has an index value of uh, pollination potential. Um, and we parameterize it for the landscape and species values in the context. So um, this is what the sort of model farm looked like, uh, you know, and so here, here, here it is with some center pivots that have uh, lucerne, some other paddocks, and then we put revegetation or more revegetation or more revegetation into the landscape. Um, and we actually tried some different sort of shapes. You know, this is what um, Dave Summers did, the GIS and a geographer was working with me. So, you know, one is you put rings around them, other one is you put belts on each side, etc. It turned out it didn't make much difference. Um, here's the real thing that made a difference. So. Um, what you can see here is the pollinator abundance change uh, for a given level of revegetation. And so this is the level of revegetation. This is the pollinator change. And so you see these, these uh, here, low, medium, high. That's about the context you're working in. If you're in a context where um, there's no trees around you anyway, then planting some, the, having some planting strips around your farm becomes uh, fairly important. It can actually have a, a fair benefit. If there's a big be reserved close by, the little bit that you're going to do with that extra patch doesn't make much difference. So that's, that's the point here. And you know, the hedgerow and donut configurations, they, they didn't make much difference. They're sort of similar. Uh, oh. The graph, oh, you're right, actually. Uh, so. so the donut is mm. Yeah, it, it's true. Except that these are these scales are oh, different yeah. too. Yeah, so yeah, it's a, scales are different. yeah. So it's it's not it's not it's not easy to compare from that. So it's probably not a great graphic. But thanks for putting that up, Merritt. I think if I can. Uh, and so in terms of NPV, uh, so what does it take for a break-even NPV? Basically, you know, um, this was looking at sort of realistic parameterization. Again, uh, basically, it would be about. Hundred dollars, so they, and and so these are. This is the gap that's that would still be needed to be filled. And so what we conclude is that um, additional income from pollination service would be required to cover the cost of revegetation, in that that exceed the possible uh, what's possible under the carbon prices. The estimated additional value of pollination is only a small fraction of the gap. 
uh, while it's beneficial, we found that doing uh, isn't enough to offset the cost of sequestration. And it may be best where there's initially low abundance uh, in, in suitability in the landscape. A uh, third co-benefit study was shelter belts. Uh, so, you know, it's potential for significant uh, farm benefit for livestock, additional sequestration value, and um, possible other values that we didn't really assess. So the point here is that if you look at this, this is the, um, th this is how, uh, additional uh, profit per year is affected by wind chill in open landscapes, right? Um, and so the point is that the more the wind chill, uh, the less the profitability. And this shows areas that are prone to high land mortality due to stress in South Australia. And so the point is that uh, down here, you know, at the, at the border down here is a particularly important area. So, we establish a relationship between wind chill and land mortality rates um, over the intensive agricultural areas of South Australia. Uh, they were differentiated um, on key variables, wind speed, temperature, and rainfall. Um, shelter belt effectiveness at reducing wind chill and likely land mortality was calculated with an emphasis on reduction in uh, twin land mortalities. Uh, and an economic overlay estimated the returns required from carbon credits uh, that would see uh, shelter belt establishment economically viable considering lamb benefits and uh, carbon benefits. So we've got these maps of wind chill and what you can see is that you know in the coldest months of uh, of winter the wind chill is highest across parts of the Mount Lofties ranges and uh, the lower southeast. Um, and this is the this is the economics results. So what we can see is that it depends. If you're very optimistic about your twinning, right, um, then you can see that, uh, and this is realistic, pessimistic, and optimistic. That's the benefit of the, of the uh, wind chill. And optimistic about the benefits of the wind chill, you can see that, you know, everything's viable. Uh, under the more realistic sort of sets of assumptions, sort of in the mid-range here, what we can see is there are some little patches that are, that are quite viable. So just a little bit like some of the other results here, you know, we can see that there may be some niche opportunities where, where the opportunity is best uh, to do this kind of thing. You know, it might be 5% of the landscape or something like that. Uh, carbon price is significantly higher than the auctions would be required for land belt shelter to be um, cost effective in addition to carbon at the kinds of prices we see currently. It's most promising in high rainfall areas of the southeast and Mount Lofty's ranges. Uh, under moderate to optimistic land survival improvements, uh, break-even economics is not far off of recent ERF estimates. Obviously, they become more attractive with more optimistic assumptions. So I guess where there's potential for it, it it's kind of limited in, under current conditions. So the study conclusions based on all of this are essentially that you know, at current and foreseeable prices for carbon credits, uh, Large-scale change um, to primarily carbon sequestration is unlikely for SA. Um, even at three times the carbon price, economically viable land use change are estimated to provide only a small fraction of CO2 offset relative to South Australian emissions. So, fifty dollars basically, um, if we started a program of this right now, um, you might offset two percent of the emissions to 2021 from now. Um, Co-benefit case study showed possibilities to narrow the gap. Uh, pollination and lamb mortality um, were both provided some valuable farm benefits, but mostly not enough to, for combined um, carbon and co-benefits to offset implementation costs in most cases. Uh, water quality benefits achievable were closer to justified through carbon and co-benefits in the form of avoided cost of chemical water treatment in uh, Adelaide water treatment facilities. The overall conclusion um, is that uh, it's unlikely to see um, intensive carbon plantings over broad swaths of uh, South Australia's intensive agricultural zone. There are bespoke and niche opportunities, uh, especially where the opportunity costs for current land use are low. Uh, additional benefit from land use are valued by the landowner substantially. Maxime Polikoff's um, 
journal article about uh, the value of revegetation in um, Victoria has received a lot of attention as I've talked about this. I've talked about that a lot. It'd be an interesting angle to look at, you know, whether or not there are possibilities to um, revegetate fractions of farms where there's utility in that for farmers themselves that can be realized in things like real estate value. Um, interestingly, Maxime, I had a conversation with DPI New South Wales that's been dealing with a lot of people in New South Wales who are interested in this, and they say, yeah, I'd love to do part of my farm. Uh, why? Ca uh, shelter? Uh, something else? No, nah, it's aesthetics, and I think I'll realize it in market value. So I think your, your uh, hedonic price model across Victoria is very relevant here. And we don't know what it, what is there, why do they do that, but, but they do. Because yeah, but... Partly, it was, like shelter, partly, like, combination, partly water quality, but also aesthetics. I think that's right. So it was interesting. So the, the, the woman who had done a lot of uh, work with stakeholders and was talking about the interviews was saying that they seem to be identifying, they see it as a value, uh, as an amenity value for themselves and, and it makes their property value. People like to come under a property that has some trees uh, somewhere, has you know, trees going down the road and you know, it's, it's actually, uh, and, it's priced into, and it's actually priced into real estate. So that, that might be an angle that could be pursued. Um, so what can be done? Provision of better information to landholders about how ERF requirements work, the economics of participation, and understanding of potential goal benefits could help improve the situation. Um, and I think there's more opportunity. Uh, there's always more opportunity for research. We all want an ARC grant, don't we, on stacking multiple benefits in this case, and uh, better methods to account for heterogeneous carbon sequestration rates and how those might affect the economics. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>